into the Spanish Grand Prix, even I was looking at my predictions thinking I should really just say Max Verstappen for everything because it's probably going to be the dullest race after Bahrain, if not instead of Bahrain. So roll the titles. Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jesse Billington, and we are back to preview this weekend's Spanish Grand Prix. And when I say we, I mean all three of us. I'm joined by none other than Mr. Timo Albus Daly and my ever capable co host and co navigator, Miss Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you both? Quite well, thank you. We're going to have quite a busy weekend with not just the F1 but the F2, the F3 and the F1 Academy this weekend so there goes any weekend plans for me when you add into the fact that uh, IndyCar is at Laguna Seca with Indy Next so I shall not be doing much else this weekend I fear but I, I don't mind that at the same time Isn't there also NASCAR as well this weekend? Yes but I'm prioritising IndyCar if I'm going to have to watch one or the other and, and sleep considering the start times for F3 and F2 on Sunday morning so we're going to leave it at a reasonably unreasonable level. Yeah. I'm good, thank you. Is that it? We're not going to get into a discussion over the weekend, or are you still sort of too exhausted and You were going to do a separate podcast that? about this, so I didn't have to get involved and feign interest. We weren't going to do a separate podcast about it. We've, I've got video that I need to edit together to do like a little mini vid on it, more so than anything. But, I mean... Exactly, you just add some... some audio to that afterwards going oh wasn't that a bit bum in seats moment and there you go so we can well, move swiftly into the news <laughs> no i think what more importantly is that jesse met lola yeah she hates me in person as well yeah apache he was quite happy to see me lola pants possum ran away yep very um, possum. and because I wasn't feeling too great Friday, so I wasn't quite ready when Jesse turned up. So he came in, and out of nowhere, she just appeared, and she made it. She made sure that she sat between us at all times, and just literally just looked at him like, "Why are you here? Go away." And then when Jessie tried to touch her, she was like, do not touch me, peasant. And even because Apache was there as well. And she usually, her and Apache don't get on because he bullies her. And she will usually scream at him if he is near her at all. But no, she was too focused on making sure that Jessie was nowhere near me. And making sure that, yeah, he was nowhere near her human. You've heard of leave room for Jesus, but this was more leave room for Lola. It was same concept, different execution. But I was yeah. more thinking about a conversation around consent, but we went different and used this. Yeah, more simply a case of one of Ellie May's cats hates me, one of them is terrified of me, the other one is sort of relatively ambivalent towards me, which seems to be the general reaction I get with most cats is general ambivalence. So at least one of them matches the trend. Anyway, cat chatter aside, there will be a video about our, exp- our exploits going classic rallying uh, coming soon-ish, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got some Formula 1 news to dive into. And well, this is one that I sort of wanted to just sort of get out of the way to begin with, because much like se- seemingly everything in the UK at the moment, uh, the FIA praise prize giving has been deported to Rwanda. Um, I don't know why it's being hosted there. But given that the post announcing this had the hashtag visit Rwanda slapped on the bottom of it, um, I'm assuming there was a sizable check attached to the invitation to the FIA to host their prize giving at the end of the year in the small African nation. It's a bit of an odd one. So essentially, whatever the British government paid Rwanda, they then used to pay the FIA. Yeah. Essentially, we're sort of just sort of delegating it by proxy at this point. So sort of going, here's the money, you host it. And um, yeah, it was a strange one. I don't know. It's just a bit of a baffling choice, especially because Rwanda, not a big motorsports nation. Well, like, the issue is, well, not the issue. I'm, I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't mind it being in Rwanda. But why are we having a prize giving first before we actually have an F1 race? Yeah. In Africa. Yeah. It's it's a very strange one that 
we're sort of heading there and especially like not even a nation that has hosted motorsports events like i can understand kenya you've got wrc kenya i could understand sort of morocco which has had formula e south africa which has circuits that would work and has hosted formula e as well but instead rwanda it just feels like a strange left field choice and i'm curious as to know what the actual mechanics behind that decision were Timo, you've remained perfectly silent on this one, as I fear it could go sort of relatively downhill if you were to chime in. So we'll move on to something you might wish to chime in on, which is, of course, um, Williams now have a head of aerodynamics. They've somehow been without one for a year at this point, and uh, they've now moved Adam Kenyon into the role. Uh, Pat Fry joined the outfit last year as chief technical officer and has been working with James Fowles, sort of cementing a team, building up the right people, making sure the right people are in the right places. And... um, one of those places they were looking to find the right person for was head of aerodynamics, a seat that has been empty since David Wheater left it around the same time that Joska Pito left the outfit in late 2022. Kenyon has worked with Vals previously at Mercedes and Red Bull before that, so pre- presents a relatively positive signing for the outfit, and it's an outfit that's working to re-energise itself. It's bringing in names that its sort of team principal knows. Hopefully we're heading in the right direction quite like the fact that it took them this long to find someone for the role because it shows that they're taking it seriously for the long term in terms of putting the groundwork and everything together and not just flinging someone at the role going, fix this car and make it a Grand Prix winner and the person going, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And yes, it would have been preferable had it not taken this long at the same time, but to me, it goes that they're taking a good look around. They want to make sure that they can find the right people if they're willing to wait a bit of time to get those people, then so be it. And my bold prediction here will be, not necessarily because of this specific signing, there'll be a lot of pressure to put on the new guy, but in the next five years, they'll win a Grand Prix. I think on that's merit. A good, that's a good prediction. I like that prediction. I mean, I don't know really too much about him, but... I did see that they promoted him back in March, but sort of kept the news quiet until now, which, to be fair, I think in a way is maybe perhaps sort of nice for him because then it's not suddenly like this ambush and sort of pressure on him to perform immediately. Um, But does it mean that we now, Adrian knew he's not going there? Maybe. I mean, Adrian knew was reportedly at Aston Martin earlier today for what maybe you're describing as discussions maybe he was just buying a car who knows uh yeah. um, but yeah the... if i were adrian newey i'd just be going to every single team at the moment purely for a nice catch up with a friend that he in obviously will have there and he's just doing it to troll the internet and going i'm actually going to Alpine, or am i going to alpha Tauris? am i going to ferrari i'm going to nascar that's what i'm really going to do here he's just going to go a little bit of everywhere because he knows that people are going to report on it for easy clickbait articles and he's like i'll just tell you when i tell you and you can all just shit your pants in the meantime thinking what does all this mean it is quite a good bit of fun imagine if it's like adrian knew he goes to ferrari and it turns out it's not actually the F1 section, it's like whack. I or it's a different Adrian that. Newey. It's just yeah. some guy who happens to share the same name. I mean, that is a real fun thing you could do if you were it's the sort of thing that you could find. He's got like enough money to hire amateur doing. actors to oh, we've been different routes again. Yeah, I was thinking like Steak or Hass could simply sort of hire like, I don't know, a graphic designer that happens to be called Adrian Newey and go, We've hired Adrian Newey, meet our new head of poster development, Adrian pretty sound fella thing you think with that is though that stake would do that for the social media for the buzz and because they're a bit of a joke on that side of things at the moment alpine would do it thinking they've signed the real adrian newey yeah that is the main flaw alpine would do it going we've signed adrian newey we've signed adrian newey he looks different from his photographs yeah chap turns up with some coloring pencils as opposed to his sort of nice sort of sketchman's table and it's sort of going yeah i'm your new graphic designer no one oh there's been a miscommunication here anyway you mentioned uh paid actors and speaking of paid actors of course the f1 movie has a release date june 27th 2025 all the teams are posting about it 
as in they're putting out pretty much the same post between the lot of them going June 27th, 2025. It'll be available in cinemas thanks to Warner Brothers and on streaming, of course, via Apple, starring Brad Pitt, Damson Idris, Kerry Condon, uh, Javier Bardem, Tobias Menzies, and is, of course, directed by Joseph Kaczynski. God, that read like the blandest sort of preamble to some sort of promo video ever. But yeah, I mean, they've just been filming a crash sequence at Silverstone. Um that was what Joe was really doing a couple of years ago. It was just an audition piece for the film to see if he could get into it that way, as he might be out of a seat next year. Yeah, just hoping he can sort of just live off the um, subsidiaries from the acting in the film. I don't know. I think are the driver's getting paid for that. If you've appeared in the film, will you get sort of like payment Royal- for it, royalties from it? Royalty, I don't know. I hope so, because they've paid so little. It'd be nice to see them get some some contributions. They're, they're scraping by all the bread line as it is. They need it. Yeah. Like, I wonder how that works. Like, what? I quite like, like the idea of Logan Sargent getting a bit of money out of this. He gets a lot of attention and then gets a role as a stunt driver, kind of Tanner House style, out of the back of this when he doesn't get his F one seat for next year. Well, because he's good at crashing. Um, but sort of has George has George Russell had to sign up to SAG AFTRA? Is he now sort of is he part of like an actors guild? No, they're probably part of. The um isn't there a separate bit for um oh what the background actors called extras 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 yeah isn't there like the, your own little like website and things that you join an agency I believe there is yes yeah. so maybe they'll get paid like extras money they'll just be classed as an extra they'll be they'll get like be quite fun you were looking at the credits of the film and you get to just an extras category and they've just listed every single extra from the film and you've just got a spot because every 10th or 20th name is an f1 driver they've just hidden in amongst it all <laughs> yeah just sort of watching things going, oh, yeah, that's mark Webber. i don't know what you get paid for a day to be an extra is it like it's not bad it varies mm. i know it's not bad like i've looked i looked at it a couple of times when i was broke at uni like I just took a day and went off and beat, beat an extra in a film. Apparently, it's not. You've got a very different definition of poor, but all right. Yeah. I'll just go and be an extra. That's my reference for this here. Well, I needed a job I could do with very little skill and talent. And apparently, standing around looking at martial art is sort of, relatively speaking, within my remit. So it, it figured. I'll give you that. I was nearly cast. I reckon as the... it's harder than it looks. I was nearly cast as the Duke of Wellingborough. I think in the crown, one of the early seasons of that, that was a very strange. Doesn't time. matter though because it was nearly, so no one gives a shit. Yeah, it's the closest to television fame I've ever come. Anyway, um, moving on to the F1 exhibition, which is coming to London. It's been sort of touring most of Europe, and it is full of interesting exhibitions and sort of bits and pieces from F1 races gone by, including the burnt out chassis from Romain Grosjean's Haas in 2020, wasn't that? Um, the we exhibition we invariably do a joke from him about have you found my shoe yet? Yes, we get it, Roman. You survived that crash. Yes, yeah, we do. Uh, anyway, the exhibition opens on August the 23rd at the XL Centre in London, which is relatively easy to get to for me, actually, so I might finally get along and see this, because it was that I'll fly to Barcelona to look at it. Um, anyway, so F1 exhibition out of the way. Uh, we'll move into a bit of IndyCar, and Nolan Siegel is set to race for Arrow McLaren, which if you're listening to this and thinking, I thought they just signed Theo Porcher. We're thinking much the same thing. Um, basically, Timo, what, what's gone on? What, what What's led to this sort of signing series? Yes, we're into my realm a bit more here because this has been a story that has been going on for quite a while. Because we started the year at Aaron McLaren with Pat Ward, Alexander Rothley, Rossi rather, and David Lucas. Lucas had a cycling incident in yet another advertisement for racing drivers not to cycle and was replaced by Callum Milop, very capable driver. But then he was replaced with Peo Porcher after it was confirmed that the team had let go of Malukas. And we kind of figured that would be the season, but no, no, monsieur, it was not. Uh, because Nolan Siegel was now going to be driving for the team for the remainder of the season and beyond after signing a brand spanking new contract following his victory at Le Mans, although he probably signed it a bit before. He's currently P4 in Indy Next, having won the opening round in St. Petersburg and scoring two second place finishes at the second and third race of the championship in that season and in theory driver wise they should now be sorted for at least the rest of the season it's a little unclear as to why Porsche was shafted there's a little bit of talk around it but nothing confirmed yet so I'm not going to dive into that and Malukas meanwhile has been signed by Mayer and Racing which should give Porsche a bit of hope because while there's no news on where he's going to go next 
and it must be quite frustrating to be him. The silver lining here is that there's surely a future for him in IndyCar. Other drivers take other drivers, other teams rather take note of drivers like that, like they did with Malukas. So even if he doesn't get back in the seat this season, he'll have a seat for 2025 if he wants it. And this year he could just return to Japan to compete in Super Formula and just get some seat time going. But with that, it's quite frustrating, like I said, to be him because you've only been given a few races to kind of get grips with things. And IndyCar is very competitive at the worst of times. So it was it was a curious decision and nothing against Nolan Siegel because he's a very talented driver, but it's all a bit odd. And Pierre McLaren are just a little bit all over the place at the moment. So hopefully driver-wise this should settle things down a little bit and they do need that a lot especially considering I believe it was Long Beach not that long ago, back in April I think Porsche was his first or second race with him and he was the highest ranking driver for most of that race if not for the entire race and when you've got Pato and Alexander Rossi driving for you something's not quite going to plan there so it's a bit odd that he got thrust aside like this but Nolan's very capable, Pale should land on his feet, it's just a matter of time and it gives us something to talk about because apparently there's never too much in-season news in IndyCar. And this year, I join a podcast and everything starts happening. So I'm going to take some responsibility. Yeah, I think it, it's it's great because Maluka somehow broke his wrist, spent a lot of time doing TikToks, cycling, cycling, then recovered from it, got a new seat, all before <laughs> McLaren actually sort of finally picked someone to replace him. It was quite funny, the fact that he was sort of able to sort of join, injure himself, never race, get kicked from the team, spend some time making TikToks, find another team, all before the team that kicked him out actually found someone to replace him. It was a bit mad. But I mean, even then, there was a great tweet from Scott McLaughlin earlier today. And he said, uh, let's take a moment's silence for all the trees sacrificed to McLaren contracts. Weirdly, Tony Kanan uh, kicked out him and said, uh, a shame pushed to pass, didn't have a moment's silence in St. Pete. Uh, we can take one together if you like. And then... Um, Scott McLaughlin unnecessary. Replies, unnecessary. Scott McLaughlin though hits back as the great promoter he is with uh, TK. If you're looking for beef, you won't find any better than Good Ranchers. I can send you a box this weekend. Of course, Good Ranchers being one of the prime sponsors on his car, and you've got to hand it to Scotty, like Mac Scotty Mac. for finding a perfect moment to just pump out one of his uh, sponsorships there. But yeah, I I'm absolutely loving IndyCar this year, and I've somehow got my girlfriend into it as well because it's just so stupidly chaotic and there is never a moment's peace in that sport and I, I love it yeah I don't I wish I had more time to watch it I mean I kind of you know I see I've seen all the sort of McLaren driver swapping more than sort of Red Bull have even done um on social media I kind of try and watch it when I can um which means that I kind of thought that Porsche wasn't doing a bad job as a rookie. So I was quite surprised when the news then sort of came out. I mean, I know Seagal is, he did a great job at Le Mans uh, with Inter Europol, wasn't it? LMP2. And he does look, from what I've seen, like a good little racer. It's just tough on Porsche. Yeah, you sort of feel a bit sorry for poor Chair out of this whole thing. But, I mean, it's not the only gossip that's floating around when it comes to um, Arrow McLaren, certainly in IndyCar, because Arrow, their title sponsor, is reportedly pulling out. Again, this is a gossip. I've set up this little gossip corner section on the pod because we don't know that for certain. The other piece of interesting gossip is the fact that Alpine is looking to become a customer team, um, which sort of is an interesting one considering they provide themselves their own engines. So clearly this, if true, is a bit of an admittance that their own engines are a bit pants. And given their performance at Le Mans, where the safety car covered more distance than the Alpine hypercars, You've got to really question what are they doing at Viri at the moment if they're not making good engines? I will just caveat that and say if you didn't watch Le Mans, there was a four hour safety car period because of the weather. Yeah, the safety car ran out of fuel, I think, at one point as well, which is quite funny. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit bonkers, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I see the positives and the negatives. I mean. Renault haven't been able to build a solidly good, reliable engine for a while now. Maybe it is best that they start to look elsewhere. It's just it's kind of sad, I think, that it's kind of come to this. 
Like the Renault they... have been an, a sort of all out and out constructor pretty much since their sort of entry into the sport. And you sort of look at it and go, oh, it's a bit of a, it's sort of a last stone to fall of the old guard, as it were. You've only really left with Ferrari at that point. And yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a bummer. But yeah, that sort of gossip corner as such. Um, Oli Behrman, who has reportedly got a contract signed with Haas, um, will be sitting in for, at the team in FP1 this weekend, and he'll be replacing Hulkenberg in the session. So again, we'll get some interesting data on him, and he will again continue to sort of have a good shot at doing interesting stuff in F1. I do quite enjoy the low-key trolling he's doing of Antonelli at the moment by going, I can get in an FP1 session whenever I want. So I'm old enough, and because I don't well, need special permission. Well, sure. ah. well, yes, because he does have it now. Yes, because Definitely. Mercedes but went to the FIA the and said, oh, oh, please, please. Yes, have which is absolutely stupid, because it just takes the piss out of their own system completely, especially when you look at Colton Herter and how does he not count for special permission, but your boy who's not won an F2 race does um, this? But this is giving proof that, that well. if you're having a rough time in F2, you just have to prove yourself in F1 machinery and do it where people can actually see you, not just behind closed doors. And Ben has already proved that in Ferrari earlier this year. He's getting the chance to do it again with Hess, as he did. Was it in Mexico? I think last year he got a climbing car for the first time for FP1. So he's going to get a few more sessions this year. So I'm looking forward to that, and at least we know what he's capable of, and he's going to be able to improve a little bit on that one, whereas Antonelli is still this weird, unknown entity that we're just supposed to trust in a very messianistic kind of way, and I'm, I'm a bit doubtful on that sort of thing, but let's not stray into religion. Yeah, it's it's great to see Behrman getting sort of the support and the drive that he really needs, but at the same time, you're still looking at Antonelli and sort of going... Okay, so Mercedes have essentially admitted they're turning down sites in favour of Antonelli, and you sort of go, okay, is this a year too soon? And you're like, well, what is their plan with this? I, I, I'm I, still a bit confused by it. And while I came into this year's F2 with a huge, as part of the hype train for it, I'll admit, I think, I'm beginning to think it might be a little bit misplaced. I certainly haven't seen the performances I want from him this season. And... Yeah, we'll see what happens there. I think I'm sticking with my overall wild plan of Mercedes will bring Ocon into that seat for one year just to make Antonelli do a second year in F2. Just, just to claim on insurance that they've been building up for years and years and years of how yeah. much crash damage can we have. Yeah, I think ultimately also they maybe Toto Wolf feels he owes Ocon like one decent seat for once in his career and that will be it. Well, it's up to the driver to make a good show of it. Say something at the end. They, um, sorry, my cats are having a fight upstairs. Um, they, it's almost like they want a Max Verstappen story with Kimi they, Antonelli. They want it, but they have to force it into existence rather than let it happen naturally, which is where I think their error is at the moment. I don't think Kimi Antonelli has had the brutal childhood necessary to form a Max Verstappen. Like, you but I would also put... that like that not to be the benchmark of what makes a great driver very quickly. No, I think ultimately, yeah, it's, it's not a healthy pathway to go down, but ultimately... Child abuse. <laughs> yeah, we've seen one that is successful. Like, we haven't heard stories of Kimi Antonelli being left at petrol stations. Like, we just haven't heard that. Or maybe their dad stabbing a mechanic with a fork or all sorts of things, or genuinely being prosecuted for beating his wife. But yeah, we haven't heard those stories about Antonelli Senior so we're just sort of left in the dark and he hasn't even proved himself in F2 so we don't have the sort of I'm just waiting for the interview where they ask about his family and Toto just goes there was no father he was just conceived by the force this is what all of their development he's he's, he's got Jedi like reflexes is there some sort of acolyte reference because I haven't watched that yet no, this is just another Phantom oh. Menace reference after yesterday's success. But we'll move oh. back into Spain because I actually have some fun facts for this, which I've written that for every single episode this year, and there have not been too many, but I actually got around to finding out some interesting things. So 54th Spanish Grand Prix this weekend, which isn't really much of anything, but it's fun to say. And Barcelona has been on the calendar every single year since 1991. And Schumacher and Hamilton share the record for most wins with six each. And amusingly... And Verstappen kind of ruined this. 
from 2007 to 2016, there were 10 different winners for the Spanish Grand Prix, which is... I'm curious about this with other circuits now, so that's maybe something I'm going to do and have a little look at for the rest of the season. But you've got Massa, Kimi, Button, Weber, Vettel, Maldonado, of course, Alonso, Hamilton, Rosberg, and Verstappen in that time, which is just quite a fun mix of drive, because if you're thinking about Grand Prix winners, with the exception of Maldonado, they are the ones you'd think they're, and it's quite nice that they've all done this at this circuit. It's, it's interesting because you look at someone like Silverstone, for example, and you've got a lot of people who've won that over the years, but Lewis has done it about six or seven times and he's kind of making his own list by himself there. Whereas this is, there's a lot of variety there. So it's probably too much for me to ask for us to have a, a new driver added to the rostrum this weekend. But at the I, same time, it'd be quite nice. I'm almost mad that we're stopping at the 54th Spanish Grand Prix because then what we have the number? Fi- no, but have the 55th and then Carlos signs win it. But with what team? Well, we don't know. Williams and therefore my prediction for they win a Grand Prix in the next five years comes true, and it's all magical. And I get 10,000 points in our competition league for proving that to be correct. Carlos, if if this happens, Carlos Sainz wins the Spanish Grand Prix with Williams next year, I get 10,000 points for our podcast league. What was in the predictions one that yeah. we run? I was going to say, I can't manufacture that with the um, Fantasy League, but certainly with our points predictions game, I can I can hold you to that. If Carlos Sainz wins, you want how many? 10,000 points? 10,000, yes. I should be safe from any mate with that number. Yeah, I think statistically you would outright win the championship that year. Um, okay, I'll hold you to that if Carlos Sainz wins next year. Any specific team or just if Carlos Sainz wins the Spanish Grand Prix next year? With Williams, okay. So the most he signed my ten thousand. But didn't I put this idea into fruition? Didn't I bring this up? Why, why are you now taking the credit and getting ten thousand points? Because you didn't swoop in quick enough to make the prediction for a specific Grand Prix. No, I did. I said it's a shame that it's not. With, with yeah, you said the same with Carl Sainz. You said I didn't say which team, so I decided I'd take that from you and just. Look, 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 enough, bicker, enough bickering. Ferrari is the most successful team here through with uh, 12 victories. And equally, they'll be coming into this race on a bit of a high. Obviously, well known at this point, they won Le Mans last weekend. And they've become, interestingly with the Le Mans thing, the first team to win both the Monaco Grand Prix and Le Mans in the same year since they did it themselves in 1934. If you wind back the clock to 1934, I did a bit of uh, digging. The 1934 Monaco Grand Prix was won by the newly recruited Algerian Guy Moll, um, and he won it for Ferrari in an Alfa Romeo Tipo B P3. And this is, of course, because essentially Ferrari didn't really start making cars till quite late. They were essentially the tuning and sports arm of Alfa Romeo. It was a bit of the other way around. And um, so, yeah, he was racing in Alfa Romeo at the time. And then equally, when it came to Le Mans, uh, Philippe Etancy and Luigi Chinetti won Le Mans with a Ferrari fettled Alfa Romeo 8C2300 LMMM. So yeah, an interesting sort of repetition of fate there. And the fact that it is 90 years since they last did it as well, which is quite a nice round number to work with. And it's annoying that they're not in Indy, in the Indy 500, so that then they could win the Triple Crown. However... Shell found a really interesting point for this because, of course, Shell is a title sponsor for Ferrari. They're also a title sponsor for Penske. So technically, Shell has done the triple this year as a sort of sponsor partner. Doesn't count because they're not a team. Or no, a it doesn't. But it, it's it's a tenuous thing and it's quite fun to look at in that sort of roundabout way. I wonder... I'm just not wanting to give Shell good publicity. <laughs> yeah, I then that makes me wonder whether there has at any point whether a tyre manufacturer... Ooh, tyre manufacturer is an interesting one because pretty much all the indie cars... Firestones. Firestones, which is actually a sibling brand of Bridgestone, which Ferrari famously ran for quite Talk a long time. about a tenuous link. But I'm fairly certain... Short answer, no. ...stuff that did Le Mans was Michelin, I'm going to assume, or maybe Goodyear's. I don't know. We'll have to look into this one. We'll, we'll think about that and come back to it. Or maybe I'll do a self-insert in the edit. You'll figure out when you're listening to this. Anyway, we'll jump into our predictions for the Spanish Grand Prix. Um, pole position. We've all gone a little bit different with this one. Ellie May clearly going for points. Team and I going for interesting. Oh, well, yeah, I've gone for Max Verstappen pole. Mainly 
well, then I may as well say my podium as well, which is Max Verstappen win, Lando Norris second, Sergio Perez third, because in theory, I mean, this circuit really hurts its tyres just on one lap, and it's so it's generally high tyre degradation. So with that theory, considering the Red Bulls are very good with its tyres, they aren't that hard on them. They should have that advantage. So I've I'm now of... waiting for us to have another tyre drama debacle where they all kind of go start going pop. I've pinned my hopes all on Red Bull. Which... I mean, there are worse teams to pin all your hopes on. Ferrari, for one. Um, Timo, your pole position then? Well, actually, I am pinning my hopes on Ferrari for a pole position, at least, and Carlos Sainz, because the Ferrari is not a bad car. He's got home advantage, and it would just be quite nice. I think the cheers around Circuit de Catalonia Barcelona would be pretty good indeed if he was able to smack it on pole. Meanwhile, I've gone for his uh, number one adversary, it seems to be, um, Oscar Piastri. I reckon we're going to see a pole for Piastri this weekend. I think the McLaren's just going to get fired up enough and he's going to be able to just sort of sling it round there. I, I, it's just... My... It's it's melding moments. together, you saying it's going to get fired up next to a clip of Piastri's engine going pole. Oh. Yeah, I'll edit that together when it happens. Yeah. Well, my theory was that as much as I love Piastri and I think he's an amazing race, racing driver, the one thing that's hurting him at the minute is his tire wear, which is Spain wasn't going is not going to be that good for him. Well, he's practiced abrasion because he fell over playing paddle earlier this week and has a rather nasty graze on his knee. So he's sort of coming to terms with the idea of friction and abrasion and sort of um, tearing surfaces. So I think you say this like it was a completely alien concept to him beforehand, and he fell over. And, oh, I suddenly understood all of this stuff. I was just trying to make a joke I've about a guy falling over playing tennis. I was just trying to make a joke about a guy falling over. We'll move to our podium <laughs> predictions and. Ellie May, your podium, which you've already mentioned, Verstappen, Norris, yeah. Perez. Max Verstappen win, Lando Norris second, Sergio Perez third. Come on, man. You, you've just got to do well. You're now with Red Bull for two years. Let's do see something. something. <laughs> it, it's this guy standing there with a stick, poking it, going, do something. But he won't. Be successful. In, in vast, but also similar contrast, I've Put Perez in P two, so he'll 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 recover early, mate. He'll he'll do something, but he won't beat Fernando Alonso, who will get that elusive next Grand Prix win. And Carlos Sainz will have to settle for P three, which, considering he should be in the sport longer than Alonso is now, that's fine because he can just win at another point in time, principally next year for Williams. To give me ten thousand points in prediction standings. You've gone all Hispanic for your podium. Was there was that sort of primarily your reason? You then just pick the order. Si, senor. Excellent. Meanwhile, I've gone for Oscar Piastri, who's going to find a way of claiming he's Hispanic to a certain extent, and then Fernando Alonso and Carlos Sainz. So essentially a variation upon a theme of yours. Um, Piastri win from pole would just be exciting. I think we're due another winner this season. Uh, Alonso could be quick. I don't know. I sort of think that he's going to be a bit carried by the home crowd and Sainz, the Ferrari has been struggling with its tyres, and I don't think the hyper-aggressive tarmac of Barcelona is going to do him many favours. So, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of what I'm seeing that one boil down to. But when it comes to fastest lap, Timo, I'm backing you up on this one again. I think I think we could well, see it. It's it's going to be Carlos Sainz, because as I've always said, it's going to be in Spain that he gets fastest lap, so it makes sense. It's going to be at his home Grand Prix. It would make sense for it to be there. Mm-hmm. Hence I'm surprised that Emma's disagreeing with me, to be honest. To yeah, she's gone. I mean, it, it's it's a nice prediction, but it, it's it's going to be Carlos Sainz. I've been telling you this for months, woman. Yeah, but meanwhile, anyway, he's gone for Sergio Perez. Yeah, why not? Let's back him. <laughs> Hopefully, some... uh, again, he does something, and it's a good kind of do something, not bad. As opposed to backing it into the wall and breaking his rear wing. Yeah. Bear in mind, he's starting with a grid penalty. I just forgot that. Yes, yeah, so he'll mm. be getting his fastest lap because he'll be charging through the order to get into third position on the podium. 19th Second, third. Yeah. That is a recovery drive and a half. That's, I mean, John Watts, John Watson went from, what was it, like 22nd to, or 20, no, 21st to 1st. Yeah. Doable. So... 
If we're doing interesting um, recovery drives, there was, uh, I forget the category, it was endurance, well, it was sprint race, but it's a sports car endurance category, I believe, in the States. So driver there, Aki Freiburg, who went from 27th on the grid to third in a 30-minute sprint race the other weekend, which was just very, very impressive. And I in like a 30-minute sprint? Well. Yeah, she was very, very, very quick. That's absolutely cooking. Um Impressive stuff. Anyway, we'll move into our wild predictions, and uh, I think we've all gone for something that's a bit a bit unique here. Timo, I want to start with your one, please. I think there will be zero retirements because it'd be a little bit niche, but also quite appropriate for the kind of Grand Prix I'm expecting to have from Barcelona this weekend. Yeah, I think it's a circuit that often gives us a few retirements and often not in ways we're expecting. So, it's just not going to happen. I don't think we had any in Bahrain, if memory serves. We might have just been sergeant, I forget. But that was the kind of race where if there were any DNFs, you've forgotten about them because you fell asleep several times. And this is kind of, I feel like it's going to be equal to, if not topping that in the in the worst way there. So I feel like there would not even be any DNFs of any kind for us to have something to talk about come Monday evening. No, there well, were no, get... no retirements in Bahrain. First season opening race in Formula One history without any retirements. Logan Sargent, I apologise. It's long enough in the season that you would expect there to be reliability issues. I was going to come in Austria and be chaos. We saw them come in a bit for Ferrari last weekend, and obviously Stake has had a few issues with its gearbox in the race has gone by. So Stake we're starting... a few issues for start. <laughs> Stake just have issues, but the fact is we're starting to see these reliability ones creep in. If it's a hot weekend as well, we could see a lot of components under stress. So, yeah, I'd say zero times is quite the wild prediction. Um, I can understand why you thought maybe Sargent was um, a retirement from Bahrain. He was two laps down on the field. Um, so, anyway, uh, Ellie May, your wild prediction, and this is quite wild. Both Alpines score points. They can have a good weekend. They need one. It's not that wild, considering they got double points last time in Canada, I think. But it's still wild for them to do it two in a row. Yeah, that's the thing. Is yeah. can they can they repeat that? Can they be reliable? Not? Can their you know every component of their car be reliable enough? Can neither of drive? If there's a way to prove if they did it deliberately or by accident, do you want us to take the points away from you if it's just by accident? <laughs> Yeah, if they just sort of happenstance their way into going, oh shit, we're P9 and P10, how has this happened? As opposed to sort of having to fight their way through the order. No. Why would I, why would I agree to that? I don't know, Timo put it forward. Uh, meanwhile, I've gone for no Red Bull points, which is quite a contrast. Oh no, I didn't put uh, any Red Bull drivers on my podium. So yeah, no Red Bull points. I think we're going to see an interesting weekend and possibly reliability creeping into it. And again, the Red Bull... is also one of the rare times that all three of our world predictions could come true. Yes. Yeah, because Red Bull no Red Bull points doesn't necessarily mean retirements. It just means they're not doing great. It just means um, helping out someone on track has to stake. Oof. <laughs> we will have to see if that happens. Um, so maybe an interesting Spanish Grand Prix if our predictions are anything to go by. Um, ultimately, though, it might not be very interesting at all. I think we ought to put that out there because at least we can say one thing on this podcast was correct. That's all we've got time for on this week's episode. We will be back. Not being negative. I'm not being negative. Not being negative. You're saying that it's going to be boring. Being truthful and honest, it's the Spanish Grand Prix. Negative, realistic. Anyway, Mm -hmm. that's all we've got for this week's episode. We'll be back with a review of the Spanish Grand Prix. We've also got a review of the first five Formula Two races, which I'm editing together, and will be out about this time this week. Um, That'll be out to listen. Give it a listen. We've got Jenny Craig from Inside F2 on with us, and some rather interesting chat about. All the stuff going on in everyone's favourite feeder series alongside Formula 3. Um, in the meantime... And F1 Academy. And F1 Academy. There's a lot of feeder series. In the meantime, if you want any more from any of us, Ellie May, where can the people find you? Um, nowhere, really. Um, I've been doing a lot these past eight weeks. I've only had two weeks actually at home, two weekends actually at home, so... 
I'm taking a break from life. So, well, I'm not taking a break. I'm just recovering from it all. She's been she's been a busy lady, so she's she's having a rest. Team well, over. I'm not complaining. It's been nice, but I value sleep too. Don't we all? Timo, where can the people find you? This week there is a Rally Jamil Explainer article out over on Is It Fast? And there's going to be interviews coming out over the next few weeks with some of the growers from there. So do go and check that out. There's also an interview with American racer Carl Lockrow out on the Across the Pond IndyCar podcast that I did a little while back. So do go and check that out because that's quite a fun background podcast to listen to. It's a nice chill conversation about motorsport in America and how difficult it is to try and rise to the top there just because you just do not kind of appreciate nascar for example of how many people wanted to get into that and how difficult it is and it's really quite interesting lovely stuff and in the meantime if you want more from me you can follow me on the social medias instagram twitter and tiktok as at jesse on cars you can also read me in uh, classic car weekly our latest issue is out now we are road testing all four generations of the Mazda MX-5, NA, NB, NC, and ND. So uh, quite an interesting one to do head-to-head wise and a good bit of fun driving them around. And uh, yeah, of course, like I said, we should have a video out detailing Ellie May and I's rallying adventures in um, maybe two rally cars because the first one sort of fell a bit ill halfway through. So we had to swap cars. But anyway, that's all still to come. Um, and of course, we ought to say a big hello to our listeners in Shawano, Wisconsin, USA. Go Green Bay Packers. And if anyone at the Stubborn Brothers Brewery is listening, a case of the Dairyland or Ruby Fruit beers wouldn't go amiss. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again soon.